Welcome to today's Federal Society virtual event. Today, April 21st, 2023, we are excited to present the second part in our Threats to Taiwan webinar series. This program will focus on understanding the military dynamics of a U.S.-China conflict. My name is Jack Apizi, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups here at the Federal Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for any questions you might have. If you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll handle questions as we can towards the end of today's program. Our panel today includes Mark Kansian, retired colonel, U.S. Marine Corps, is a senior advisor at the International Security Program at CSIS, and his recent report, The First Battle of the Next War, Wargaming a Chinese Invasion of Taiwan, helped inspire today's program. We're also joined by Professor Julian Ku, who's a Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, the Faculty Director of the International Programs, and the Maurice A. Dean Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Law at the Hofstra University Law School. Uh, our moderator today is Professor Jamil Jaffer, who's an adjunct professor, the National Security Institute founder and director of the National Security Law and Policy Program at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Uh, thank you all for being with us today. Uh, with that, Jamil, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks uh, to all of you for being here. Obviously, uh, a significant issue and a timely issue for us to be talking about here as the Federal Society and the International Law and National Security Practice Group. Uh, just this past week, uh, the Select Committee on China and the House of Representatives held a war game about the invasion of Taiwan by China. Uh, Chairman Mike Gallagher uh, played out the scenario along with his ranking member, Roger Christian Murthy. And we're going to do a similar conversation today. We're going to have uh, Colonel Kansian walk us through some of the potential scenarios in a Taiwan conflict. We're going to talk to Professor Ku about the legalities and issues that play there. Um, and we'll take some of your questions from the audience as well. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat, the Q&A function, um, and we'll come to you uh, towards the end of the, uh, the end of this scenario discussion. So Colonel Kansian, over to you for some analysis of what might happen um, in a potential Taiwan-China scenario. Great. Well, thanks for having me uh, on your program. Let's see if we can have the uh, slides up here. That might help. Um, there we go. Uh, having spent many years in the Pentagon, I've lost the ability to speak without PowerPoint, so this is a tremendous help for me. Uh, okay, what we're going to talk about is uh, this. Let me the next slide here. Uh, and I just wanted to give you a, a sense about first, you know, so where this is coming from and you know why it is that uh, I'm here talking to you. Uh, and here at CSES, we ran a war game project, as you can see up here. Uh, we developed a war game, a physical war game. You can see one of the uh, iterations on the right there. Uh, we ran it 25 times. It was entirely unclassified. Uh, we brought in players, as you can see, from many uh, different backgrounds, and it it got a tremendous amount of attention. The there's a tremendous thirst out there for information about a U.S. Thai, uh, China conflict. Most of the information is uh, classified, uh, not very much out in the uh, unclassified world. So became you know, front page news all over uh, Asia and really uh, around the world. So we were very gratified with the reception. Um, I just want to note the outcome. I don't want to go into a lot of the details. I mean, I, I can if people have questions, um, but we capture the, the main elements of the outcome. Uh, there you can see about maintaining an autonomous Taiwan, but it comes at very high cost. U.S. and its allies lose dozens of ships, hundreds of aircraft, and thousands of personnel. Chinese also lose heavily enough so that that might destabilize the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and we hope that uh, they have read the report. In fact, we know that they have, and we hope that it maybe has some uh, influence on uh, deterrence. But coming from that body of analysis and uh, wargaming, uh, we came up with a couple of scenarios that might help uh, to spark a discussion about the legal aspects of warfare and what might be involved in conflict with China. So our, the first uh, scenario here is the obvious one, you know, invasion. Classic, you know, China um, attacks Taiwan and the US. Uh, in our war games, we assume that China would attack US forces at the same time attack uh, Taiwan, very much making the same calculation that the Japanese made in 1941. Uh, you can see from the bullets there how the game plays out. Uh, landing forces on Taiwan, uh, causing major casualties, including two aircraft carriers. We can talk about that. Um, and then the U.S. immediately 
uh, starts taking action. So a couple of questions, of course, come up with regard to uh, you know major conflict like that, like this, about what sort of authorizations might be required or might be uh, useful. Uh, and with that, I will turn the discussion over to the lawyers. Well, thanks, Mark. Really appreciate it. Uh, and so, so, Julian, talk to us about what um, what this scenario entails. So, you know, uh, uh, Colonel Cancian teed up a couple of questions, right? Is an AUMF needed and like? Uh, talk to us about some of these issues that come into play if Taiwan, uh, sorry, if, if China invades Taiwan and simultaneously attacks U.S. forces, sinking two aircraft carriers, causing casualties. The U.S. has begun defensive operations. Do we need an AUMF? How soon? When? What might we do that would trigger an AUMF? Talk us through some of those concepts. Okay, yeah. So just the basic uh, constitutional law on this is, uh, uh, as you know, the, the Congress has the power to declare war, but the president has a lot of residual authority to conduct military operations absent congressional authorization. So on the U.S. constitutional law side, the one rule that seems pretty clear that no one disagrees with <laughs> is that when the United States territory is attacked, the U.S. president can take military force to respond without going to Congress. Um, it also seems le a little less clear, but also pretty clear that when U.S. forces are attacked, even when they're uh, as long as they're in international waters, um, they also or overseas, um, uh, they also uh, have the right to respond so they can defend themselves. So the U.S. can act to defend uh, their own military forces and use military force to defend themselves uh, without going to Congress to get authorization. So in the scenario Mark lays out, if the US has been attacked uh, sort of preemptively by China, which is a real scenario. I mean, I think you can imagine the, that's part of the plan for the Chinese um, invasions and knock out US forces. Those US forces would be authorized to defend themselves and to strike back at the forces that were attacking them. Um, and so I think that without any congressional authorization being required. Um, so I think that's, the basic framework. Where it gets trickier um, is whether U.S. forces could, in responding to the attacks on them, launch attacks on Chinese forces in China, on the mainland China. That, for instance, imagine missiles coming out of China being used to attack U.S. forces, uh, you know, in international waters. Could then the U.S. start bombing those 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 missile bases that are in China? Um, and um, again, I, I think there's a reason to think that they could do so as part of their own defensive, their right to defend themselves. But obviously that is um, escalatory, I guess, <laughs> right? So- well, but um, why, but, but, but Julie, let me ask you, why, why is that controversial? I mean, that seems like straight classic self-defense. You fire missiles at me, I hit you where you fire, where you fire your missiles from. That, is, there, is there any real question that they, they need authorization to do that? That doesn't seem- Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it, I think it's, we don't quite have that, that scenario exactly, but yes, I think that, um, you know, there is some, there's, when you, when you attack the uh, territory of another country, even though they're attacking at you, they're launching at you, it is still a, a step beyond just defending yourselves in international waters. So I think that's, that's, I think, well, the area well, a little that? bit different. So I, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think, because then it opens the door to what, what, are there any limits on what you could hit within China, you know, that, or are you, I think, Maybe the best way to read it is you're limited to hitting those things that are threatening you, missile bases, but you can't just take out general sort of unrelated facilities that aren't attacking you. If it's really a defensive under, inter you, so you, so you, under international law, so you don't think you don't think the right of self-defense under international law uh, where you've been attacked, right, enables you to take out the opposition's ability to attack you again. Um, well, I think that you can, right? So there's the right of self-defense, right? right? So under international law, um, right. what right is the right to um, defend your country and your territory? Whether that extends to your military forces that are overseas is one thing. In other words, what I'm saying is that there's a distinction between if they attack the United States territory, Hawaii, Guam, yeah. that is distinctive than they attack a U.S. Uh, carrier that's in international waters. I think under... In both cases, we can the U.S. forces can respond, but it's a harder question when they're being attacked uh, when it's not U.S. territory. I think the most likely scenario, I think the lawyers would come out with, is that they can attack and respond in yeah. Yeah. But the use of force has got to be proportionate to what yeah. force is used against them, so they can't. Well, it can't be a massive uh, yeah. unrestrained retaliation. 
So, Mark, you know, when you were when you were serving, I mean, does that sound right to you? Is that how you understood sort of the rules of engagement? If you're if you're attacked, right, you can respond at some level immediately, right? But but when do you have to wait for for presidential authorization, right? And is is there a line as a commander in the field? Uh, if you're advising commander in the field, or you're the commander in the field, how do you think about that problem uh, from a from a practicality perspective? You've been hit right now. Can you fight back immediately, or do you have to wait for presidential authorization? And maybe if the president wants to wait for Congress, then may wait for Congress. Well, yeah, I think there's no question that the military could take defensive action. So if the Chinese are yeah. launching missiles at our ships, you know, we can use all of our defensive uh, capabilities against those missiles. Of course. Um, right. The, the thing is that the military is going to come back and say, OK, we want to strike the missile bases uh, right. and uh, on the mainland. Uh, well, first, yeah. we, want to, we want to strike their fleet you know, which is now right. in international waters. And we also want to strike the missile right. bases on the mainland. And, you know, that is going to be a presidential decision where he brings yeah. it. In. Very yeah. Simple. So, so uh, Julian, so one of the things we were talking about was put aside international law was, was, was does the president need an AOMF? So if the president is acting in, in, in self-defense, do we think he needs an AOMF? And then what happens if he decides, okay, I, I've, I've hit the Chinese back. I've hit them where they, you know, where they hit me. Now I want to go defend Taiwan because they brought us into this war, right? Now I want to go defend Taiwan as well because we're not part of this on the other side of the battle. Can he do that without an AUMF? Does he, is he required to get an AUMF? Can he do it without it? What's, what are the arguments? What about the War Powers Resolution, which is that thing that was passed after Vietnam that purports to constrain presidents and every president to look at it has said, well, I'll act, you know, I'll act, you know, you know, in, consistent with it, but not pursuant. What about the War Powers Resolution? Does that matter here at all? Either? Yeah. So the framework is is as you know, uh, it's a little muddy, muddy. But I think uh, the way we've sort of the U.S. has acted in pa in the past. So there have been several incidents in the past fifty years when the U.S. has acted. Yeah. Use military force overseas. The basic sort of framework is that the U.S. president is authorized to use force. Um, consistent with the War Powers Act, which means that at least for 90 days, he's allowed to use force as long as he reports to Congress. Um, and uh, the only limit that really even uh, that lawyers have really identified under this framework, therefore, is, uh, is as long as he does not engage in war. Now, war being a technical term in this case, because right. the word war is used in the Constitution. Congress has the power to declare war, uh, not uh, not the not the president. Um, now, but we haven't declared war since 1945, right? We haven't so, war. so there is some there is some arguments about whether declare war requires you to actually um, go to Congress for anything other than a legal sort of framework. But there is also I'm just just pointing out there is a body of law which is embodied in, for instance, in the Office of Legal Counsel, Department of Justice opinions about the Libya conflict, where uh, the Obama administration, Department of Justice, argued that use of force by the president, um, short of war, uh, can be used effectively for anything that threatens national interests, um, as mm. consistent with the War Powers Act, um, and maybe arguably not even consistent with the War Powers Act, but that the only limit really there is whether it would uh, give rise to a war. And there's a threshold yeah. for whether something's a war, and we've never met that threshold since 1945, um, yeah. Maybe we have. So Iraq might have would have been that threshold, maybe if we but we had an authorization. Vietnam would have been that threshold. But we had sort of an authorization. So that's that's sort of where the and then the def definition of what would give rise to a war is a lot of different factors. There's a major yeah. conflict um, where uh, you know you would uh, U.S. forces would be uh, you know under attack. Ground troops might be one factor you consider. So that's the framework now. Um, yeah. so therefore, I think there's a broad. So that's why I think there is the Taiwan scenario is tougher than some of the other scenarios we've seen, because, um, you know, when you respond to an attack on U.S. forces, I think that's clear you can respond. Um, when you go to Taiwan and start fighting with Chinese forces there, that is, you know, it's is it likely to give rise to a war? Well, I kind of think it might. Right. I mean, certainly under many conventional definitions. And so that's where I think uh, you know a lot of scholars would say yes, you do need authorization. Now there's some like my yeah. friend, uh, uh, most probably my friend John Yu at uh, Cal Berkeley, who I would say probably not. No, he doesn't need authorization unless Congress wants to sort yeah. of pull them back. But I think that there's certainly going to be an argument which I think would get some purchase in Congress that we need to authorize anything beyond just defending U.S. forces, which I think everyone yeah. would need, even. 
the most aggressive folks uh, on yeah. the left that uh, U.S. forces can defend themselves. Yeah, got it. Okay, so we got we got some legal issues here. Uh, some questions about whether the president needs to go to Congress or not. It uh, looks like at least in the response, he doesn't. If it's going to be a longer term conflict or he's going to go defend Taiwan, maybe he ought to, but maybe he doesn't have to. You know, we, we have sort of that going on. So, so Colonel Kansian, talk to us about another scenario. Give us another scenario. And we've already got eight questions in the chat, so we're definitely going to be able to take some questions later on, folks. So go okay. ahead, Colonel Kansian. Next All right. Scenario. Well, the, the second scenario is really just like the first one, except that the Chinese do not attack U.S. forces. They only attack Taiwan. Um, yeah. And uh, we do see, you know, they would, uh, you know, some maybe uh, cyber intrusions, cyber attacks on uh, U.S. systems, but, you know, no kinetic action. So the question then is, OK, if, you, if the president wants to defend Taiwan with military force, now does he need to do anything different? Yeah. And again, I turn this over to the lawyers. All right. So, Julian, what about that? The only Taiwan, no attack on U.S. forces. Does the president need to go to Congress and can he get around Congress or does it help with Congress, whatever, if he has a U.N. resolution that says, you know, or does it help with international law? If he has a U.N. resolution. What about Taiwan? And, and does Taiwan have a right of self-defense? And can they ask us to help them in the right of self-defense? OK, I think a lot of questions here. All right. A lot so, of questions. Yes. Yeah, so Multi-part question. Let me work backwards there. So Taiwan should have the right of self-defense, but this is where Taiwan's legal status under international law is yes. a problem. It's not a member of the United Nations, mostly because China won't allow it to become a member of the United Nations. And therefore, uh, the right of self-defense under the UN Charter only extends to members of the United Nations. And so in theory, ah. under this reading, they don't have the right to self-defense under the UN Charter, although you could argue that they certainly have the customary right of self-defense. So um, but this is the problem for Taiwan. It's what makes them different than Ukraine because they're not a recognized mm. state. Uh, they have, under international law, a weaker claim to self-defense and also, therefore, a weaker claim to invite other countries to assist them in self-defense. Uh, which no is a legit thing. Which is a legit thing. So uh, Ukraine has the right to ask other countries to help it defend itself. And there's a right of the collective, the right of collective self-defense in international law under the UN Charter as well. So Ukraine is exercising all those things. In theory, Taiwan cannot use any of those international legal authorities. Mm. Um, and this is actually one of the reasons why China is so aggressive about making sure Taiwan doesn't get anywhere near the UN <laughs> and has no yeah. little recognition as possible, is to weaken this sort of claim it might make. And so that's under international law, Taiwan is in a tough position. Uh, finally, there will be no UN resolution on Taiwan allowing because, because China sits on the um Security Council has a veto, but it, right. so in the, so that's why there will be no. So that's why it is a tough spot. The U.S. acting to defend Taiwan legally under international law will be harder. In fact, it'll be very hard. But it may not matter that much because the U.S. has acted before without the authorization of international law to use military force. Most prominently in Kosovo um, in 1998, nine in, in, in Bosnia in 1995, um, and there are several other examples as well. So. UN action, UN authorization has not been, well, frankly, Iraq, arguably, also was not authorized by the UN. So, so international law, so US probably would not be deterred by that alone, but other countries might, and that's why it might matter. Other countries like the Europeans might yeah. be a little more, uh, less likely to get involved in military conflict than they would in Ukraine because of this international legal scenario. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose uh, the US side itself, I think uh, the War Powers Resolution has been read a lot of different ways. But one way to read it is that it's a little bit of a blank check for the president for 90 days. Hmm. Um, in other words, it seems to imply the president can use his own authorities under the Constitution at least for 90 days, um, as long as you report to Congress. So um, there is some argument that the president could use force to defend Taiwan or to assist, and certainly to send weapons uh, to Taiwan, but, but even to maybe provide defensive support to Taiwan uh, right. air, air support, right, naval support, um, all those things I think um, arguably could be done without going to Congress, at least for the under the 90 days. But um, it, this goes back to the conversation we just had. If there's a reason to think such actions would likely give rise to a, a war as defined under the Constitution, um, then, or essentially a larger conflict, then I think congressional authorization is, is needed. I'll just note that's why mm. since um, members of Congress, some of them have introduced authorizations for the use of force on Taiwan, to defend Taiwan, mm. to pre-authorize this, to avoid this problem, because I think there is a good argument that the president 
at some point would need to get Congress on board to support Taiwan if the Chinese have not directly attacked the U.S. Now, Colonel, I have a question for you. Does the U.S. today, let's say the U.S. today, there's a, there's a conflict in the Taiwan Straits, the Chinese invade, as you described in your scenario, and the president decides either I can do it on my own or I'm going to get to go to Congress and he gets authorization. Do we have the forces in the region today to effectively defend Taiwan and or remove a Chinese force that has landed on Taiwan without a major buildup of forces like we had in the, in the lead up to the, to the Gulf War? The short answer is yes. <laughs> yes, not a very convincing. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, the United States maintains a lot of forces in the Western Pacific. You know, in our yeah. board game, you know, we have two aircraft carriers out there. We've got lots of aircraft, uh, lots of bases, aircraft in Kadena, for example, on Okinawa, forces in Guam and Hawaii. Um, but also, you know, in a conflict, we would flow forces uh, into the yeah. theater. So, you know, every couple of days, there would be, you know, another couple of air, uh, aircraft squadrons arriving, uh, you know, ships would be sailing from the West Coast arriving. I mean, it takes them about 10 days to weeks to get there. So, I mean, the short answer is that, yes, the United States will be building, you know, we'll have some combat capability from day one, but then we'll be building mm -hmm. that up uh, over time. If gotcha. the president wants to fight over right. Taiwan, then... Right. Big if, right? Big if today, right? We've seen President Biden has said... Uh, you want to ask when asked point blank, he said, yes, I would defend right. Taiwan with American right. troops. But then, but then three minutes later, the White House staff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. Say it, please. right. And another president might answer that question differently, too. Right. right. But yeah, but Mark, you were going to say, what, what is the president? The president, well, no, so the president the says thing. yes. And then right. the president says, well, defend. And then the, this whole staff jumps up and says, well, what the president meant was, no, you know, we haven't changed our <laughs> right. policy. Right. Uh, and, you know, it is pretty crazy. amazing, right? Yeah. yeah. He's done it like three or four times um, already. Yeah, it's it's and the question is, are they intentionally being strategically ambiguous to put Taiwan to put Taiwan on the edge or are they messaging to the Taiwanese? Hey, we're not going to be there for you. We might be there for you. Or do they really just not know? Are, are they really not communicating? We, we don't know. What's, is this, this is either genius or disastrous. We're not sure. Um, all right. Give us the third scenario, please. Uh, OK, there we go. Um, this is the, the question here is about um, preemption. Uh, there's uh, and there's a lot of talk about that both on Taiwan and among the U.S. military. Uh, and here you can see the you know, situation. You know, large number of troops, more than you would see in a regular exercise. The the intelligence community believes that this is the beginning of an invasion. They tell you that their forecast is a slam dunk. Um, you've heard that before. Um, and now the Joint Staff says, you know, the easiest thing for, you know, the most effective thing we can do is to launch preemptive strikes against the Chinese while they're still in port because they're very vulnerable. Once they get out to sea, they're much better protected. Uh, the time to strike is now. Um, so the question is, you know, is there authority to do that? And by the way, All right, the, so, by the, way, the yeah. Joint Staff will say that. <laughs> There's no question they will say that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, so Julian, what about that? So we've got a classic case of, of preemption, the gathering forces, the gathering forces of evil are, are there. Uh, there's a very real threat to the United States. Um, well, okay. Can, so, can the president act if he wants to, if so he or she just, wants to? Let me put it to this way. So there is a, under both US and international law, there is, the, there is a right of preemptive self-defense. <laughs> But it's very narrow um, for mm -hmm. understandable reasons, so it doesn't swallow the whole self-defense. So there's, uh, the general idea is that it's got to be a threat that is um, almost immediate, and it's also directed at you. And here's, the, I think, the problem we're running into here is that uh, if if these forces are directed at, in other words, we can see them getting ready to hit U.S. targets, uh, either U.S. forces in international waters, U.S. forces in Japan or Guam or something, then I think the case for preemptive self-defense could be made because um, especially if you had mm -hmm. intelligence that yes, they're about to strike or they're preparing to strike. We're yeah. strike um, I think that's that's the case. The problem I'm running into here is- now, uh, we, 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 But Julie, can, can I say a real quick, yeah, yeah. Real quick question? When you say a right, does that mean a right under international law or domestic law or both? In this case, I think it'll be both. So I think because the US would okay. have the right to defend itself under international law, but- this is very difficult and very controversial, but the, if it's immediate, if we see it coming, if there's reason to think 
uh, they, they can't prevent it otherwise, then yes, we can hit those forces. Yeah. Here's the problem, though. If the, okay. if the preemptive is in, involved, is to prevent an at attack on Taiwan, uh, or was, uh, that's different. Now, if it was to prevent an attack on a treaty ally, that might be different, like Japan, like, but Taiwan- Which Taiwan is not. Right, but Taiwan itself is not, we don't even recognize it technically as a country, right? I mean, the US doesn't even recognize it as a country. Right. So to, right. to claim the right to preemptive self-defense on behalf of an entity we don't recognize as a country, which might be, which the other country claims is part of them, their territory, is going to be right. tough <laughs> um, under, I mean, under international I, law in this case. Yeah. Can I follow up though? Like, does, let's say, let's say Taiwan had a right of preemptive self-defense, which, which I understand because they're not a country, maybe they yeah. don't, right? If they had a right of preemptive self-defense, could they invite others to help them preempt? Yeah, I think that's right. They could. And that's why, for instance, the Japan scenario mm -hmm. might be easier, right? Because if Japanese okay. see them about to hit a military base in Japan, they, it's not, or the Philippines, or whatever, it's not unreasonable for the U.S. to say, okay, we will act on, you know, on your behalf in this case and invoke that right of collective self-defense, which is in the U.N. Charter, for instance. The Taiwan scenario is tough. Again, I think that's why Taiwan, its weird status is actually a problem. Now, again, I think um, we might see president take action anyways, but it would, it would come at a cost. And the cost here is that international public opinion. I'm not talking about mm. just Europe, but, you know, but but actually just you'll start with Europe, first of all, but then other right. countries uh, in the world, like India or, you know, Southeast Asia, other countries, you might need their support for something. Um, this would be tough if you really fly in the face of, uh, because they, they, they will all see this as, okay, next time the U.S. is like, oh, yeah, we see you mobilizing a few ships, we'll come blow them up too. So that's why it's a very, it's a very dangerous uh, tool to invoke um, if you want to invoke yeah. this principle. So Mark, from a, from a military perspective, has the U.S. invoked this idea of preemptive self-defense other than, I mean, I guess Iraq too, right? Arguably, right? Is that, is that the only scenario? Have we, have, we, have, we, have we taken advantage of this before? Other examples of that? Or is part of the war on terror maybe constitute that where we're, we're taking out terrorists who are planning? Talk to us about preemption. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think you're right. Certainly, 2003 with Iraq. Um, I think that, and, and uh, I think that some of the rationale for the counterterrorist campaign, the global, you know, is mm -hmm. you know sort of an argument about you know preemptive, you know, be, uh, uh, you know, strikes, future terrorist attacks. Future, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because that's right. Because these terrorists are planning something in the future. Therefore, right. we attack right. them now. We have an attack. We aren't attacking because I. I Pretty sure we've attacked some groups that have not yet attacked us or not attacked us. Yes. Um, right. But that's the only ones I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, yeah. Okay. No, I think say, that's right. Uh, Iraq, yeah. right. Iraq oh, is a really Julian. different. Iraq was a weak, a weak, much weaker case for preemptive self defense because the argument was hmm. the the WMDs they have they might use against. It wasn't like they're, we have evidence they're currently planning to use existing weapons mm. to hit us. That was not the preemptive self-defense argument in Iraq. It was, we think they have these weapons, which they might use one day, but it turns out they didn't have them anyways. But if, even if they did, yeah. that's not, that, that was sort of, that's why it was, it's a tough case. This would be a much better case. If we had like evidence, they're literally mobilizing, right? That is more yeah. than where you normally do see preemptive self-defense. But even that is, you know, very very careful and be very it's a very difficult argument it's i think this would be the hardest one to do um under both international and international so we have we have about 10 minutes before we go to the audience for their questions so mark give us another scenario all right okay so people uh there's been some um thought that china might use something like a pandemic to uh, declare a containment zone, not a blockade, of course, because it has a lot of um, uh, legal baggage, baggage. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but here you can see a scenario where you know they use force in a way, but they you know have a rationale uh, that's you know related to public health. Um, so, question: I mean, is there is there some international body that can sort of adjudicate this and? You know, is there any international mm -hmm. law that applies in a situation like this? A, a well, let's let's accept that it's a pandemic. All you could, well, you could imagine a couple of other kind of similar situations. Yeah. 
And, and this is similar, Mark, right, to what we did around Cuba when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened, right? The, so, the so-called quarantine, right? Well, Where we cut off traffic and, and challenge the Soviets to come across the line. Well, that's right. And we use the word quarantine quite consciously because, of course, blockade is an act of war. Right. Right. So, Julian, there, there, are, there are restrictions around blockades in the UN Charter. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so this is not if the a blockade would be an, a use of force. So that would be. Um, and let, let me say the next scenario is about blockade. Right, so yeah. you know, this there'll one be an would opportunity be, to talk about this that. one would be kind of and there's actually some in, in recent weeks, the Chinese Coast Guard has suggested they would conduct inspections of vessels going to Taiwan in some cases. And that would be the scenario where they would just assert some administrative health related authority to just inspect. They're not going to block mm-hmm. you, but maybe they'll inspect all ships heading into Taiwan to assert their authority over Taiwan in that respect. Um, so I think in this case, um, this is where I think the US would would not necessarily have to use force. They could essentially escort, this is the old Persian Gulf from the 1980s scenario. They could say, we're gonna mm. escort commercial shipping, what, what we believe is an illegal um, or inappropriate quarantine. Um, now, international law does not define what counts as a quarantine in terms of a treaty. Um, there are rules on, you know, how you have to treat people when you declare such a quarantine. Um, the Our old friends at the World Health Organization have defined um, in the international health regulations all the conditions and limitations, and you have to give, you have to be very careful in imposing any restrictions on travel. So there are some limitations here, not necessarily ones that would be, but in general, I would say states have broad authority, like we saw during COVID, to just impose quarantines, <laughs> to stop travel, <laughs> And there's no, it doesn't really violate any international rules very clearly, although some people argue it does. But the, the only international law would be that you have to sort of do so in a humane way, that you don't like just throw people yeah. in a canteen and like let them starve to death or something. So I think in that case, the U.S. Yeah. trying to make the, so the U.S. I think in this scenario would have to not necessarily use force, but would probably could, I think, and the president could do so without Congress, order U.S. forces to escort um, commercial shipping into Taiwan. Um, and to defy this quarantine. Now, that would be dangerous, but I don't think he needs to go to Congress for that action. Um, and nor do I think- well, So Julie, let me- let, really be yeah. a problem. Well, let me let me press a little bit on that. So, so and I assume that we're probably reflagging these ships as US flagships like we did in the Persian Gulf, is that right? So if we're doing that, um, are, would we trigger the War Powers Resolution? Because, you know, the War Powers Resolution is triggered when you put, you know, armed- uh, armed uh, armed military equipment into a scenario where they might be in hostilities, right? If, if China's declared, you cross this line, we're going to hit you, and then we intentionally cross the line with armed forces, does that trigger war powers notification? If so, the president's got 90 days, then what? Yeah, so I think that, um, I think there's certainly a good argument that it, it would trigger the War Powers Act. I'm not sure that um, that in the 1980s, the Reagan administration actually did trigger they did report to congress um when they did us mm, i don't remember yeah i don't i don't think they did i don't think they did um because i think yeah. they want to avoid a 90-day limit on on what they were doing um and they also said and they're right that they weren't attacked largely speaking right so it wasn't really introducing forces and hostilities that's a tough line but i think you could make a good argument well, that it was you know, mine right um you know um okay all right so Sorry, go ahead, Julian. Do you have something more? No, no, that's it. Great. All right, Mark, give us our last scenario, please. Okay. And here's the classic blockade scenario. Uh, and you, you know, you can see the, the bullets here. You know, there's a lot of speculation that you know China might do this at you know more likely uh, course of action than uh, out and out uh, invasion. Um, you know, searching for contraband, and of course the idea that they might narrow it to military hardware, um, you know, it's, you know, rather than just a general blockade, you know, that might be, you know, they might do that as a way to assert their sovereignty, uh, their power over uh, Taiwanese um, transportation, you know, without going, you know, full, mm-hmm. full bore on a uh, uh, blockade, you know, and getting into energy and food and all the other things to go with that. Uh, so, you know, classic uh, blockade requirements here. And the general First, the general question, you know, what does international law require for a blockade? I mean, do, are they, would they be meeting it here? Um, of course, Taiwan's a special case. So over to the lawyers. 
All right. So Julian, uh, last question, sort of the last set of questions to you before we go to the audience. Um, international law blockade, what, what do we think? Well, so it's not like, uh, so blockade is, I think China would not call this a blockade it, because because they would argue they're just imposing rules on, on their own territory, right? So we're just imposing- Internally. Right, internal rules. And so it would be analogous to what the U.S. did during the Civil War against the South. The U.S. did not call it a blockade. It would be, it would, it, but but it was a blockade, right? But it was a blockade, right? It was a blockade, In right, fact, yeah. the U.S. sort of followed international rules at the time, and the British were really annoyed. But that was essentially what was going on. Um, so I think the, the international law, essentially, the only restriction on a blockade is that it's a use of force. It's like you have to be justified to use it. You know, it's a, you, know you, you, you have to be justified to use force. It's just like striking their, you know, hitting their military bases. It's, it's, a, it's an act of war, basically. So now China, again, would say we're not an act of war because we're just imposing a rule on our own territory. Um, so I think that the U.S. would... Um, would treat it as a use of force. But again, I don't think there's much legal remedy for the U.S. in that certain area because, um, you know, the U.S. Uh, you know, the U.S. said this is outrageous, it's a blockade, but the China would say, well, no, it's not a blockade. We're just imposing sovereignty over our own territory. Um, that's, I think this is a really bad scenario. We need to think more about this scenario, which I think is a better one for China and a tougher one for the U.S. because we don't have a great response here, I think. <laughs> Right, yeah. and it would be very hard to mobilize their national opinion, especially if they say we're just searching for military items, not for well, we won't interdict commercial shipping. Um, you know, the U.S. I think the problem is that the U.S. doesn't really have a good justification in this instance for using force at all, um, um, and uh, it'd be very difficult for the president. I think would still have some general authority to to support and escort, you know, to do the same thing to escort ships in and to defy the blockade, but I think. On, from a legal perspective, again, the U.S. would be in a tough spot, I think, to argue. And and again, just because I see some of the questions like, why do we care what the, what the law means here? One, because uh, international other countries care a lot about these rules. And so to the extent we ignore them, that's bad. Um, and two, um, you know, I think, you know, domestically, we want to make sure we have some legitimacy for what the president's doing legally. Um, and so um, this one's, uh, you know, this one's a tough scenario for the, for the president. I think he can act. He could, he could he could act to send the U.S. Navy escort ships like before. Um, it's just the same problem, I think, which is that um, uh, there's going to be the very high likelihood of, of some sort of military conflict arising out of it. Great. All right. So we've we've now sort of uh, heard from uh, both our, our military expert and our legal expert on on these five scenarios that we've laid out. We have a, a you know almost two dozen questions in the chat uh, from various members of the audience, so I'm just going to sort of uh, jump into them in, in, in a rough order that I can sort of uh, divine here. So um, one of the questions is um, you know back to our original scenario, right? And there are two questions I'd like I'd like both of you to address. I'll start with you, Mark. Um, one, uh, Jared Vance asked, if the U.S. lost two carrier strike groups off the bat. How are we going to replace those to come back and win? Talent already got on the offensive and might be able to defer for the U.S. Navy support given the, its sub fleet and its long ranged uh, cruise missiles. Um, are we concerned about that from a military strategy perspective? And uh, what about from a both a military perspective from you, Mark, and from you, Julian, a legal perspective? What about a shock and awe campaign in response to an attack on U.S. warships? So we've got our carriers that have been sunk. What if we just go and, and can, can we legally and would it be advisable militarily? to engage in a significant response to strike to demonstrate that we're, gonna, we're not going to take this going. Uh, so, Mark, I'll start with you on both those questions. Yeah, on, on the, the question about you know, how would how is the United States going to win after losing two carriers right off the bat, uh, my short answer is going to be read our report, because we do talk about that at some length. The, the short version is that the United States will be bringing in reinforcements from the West Coast and, and eventually from uh, the East Coast, although the the major uh, uh, tool for striking the Chinese fleet will be bombers with long range uh, anti-ship missiles. Uh, they, in our, when we ran our, our game, I mean, they were the, uh, uh, the real workhorses. They did tremendous damage to the Chinese fleet. Uh, US submarines were also extremely effective. We just don't have, have enough of them. Uh, the shorter range aircraft, uh, they also were effective. They had to get very close, though, and that's why we lost hundreds of them. Um, so that's the short answer about you know how how do we deal with the uh, uh, the the Chinese? Um, and uh, 
I'm sorry. Now, the second part of the, the, the question. Yeah, the, se- the second question was, let's say we decide you know, we get we are two. These two carriers are sunk. Should we would it be militarily advisable? Oh, uh, shock and awe. Uh, shock and awe. Shock and awe. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I mean, the answer is probably I mean, probably, but it's you know, I, I don't think it's feasible against the Chinese. You know, to really do shock hmm. and awe, you have to have overwhelming military force. Uh, something you might do against Iraq, something you might do against Serbia. Uh, but, yeah. you know, the Chinese military capabilities are just so great that the idea that we could overwhelm mm. their, um, you know, their defensive defenses and, you know, like rain yeah. destruction onto Beijing, uh, it's just it's just not feasible. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, so that's one set of problems. I don't think it's feasible yeah. with China. The other set of problems is not clear it really works, you know, because we, we try to do it against Iraq. Uh, and you know they they hung in there uh so right so interesting anyway. all right uh, yeah makes sense and i mean you know china's got the lar- world's largest standing army now the world's largest navy maybe not as deep water as blue waters are but still problematic um all right so julia what about what about as a legal matter um, any any thoughts on on uh, on the question whether um uh, shock and awe type response. I, I, I get the sense you might say it's it would not be appropriate. It talks about whether it would be appropriate under international law and domestic law. Right. Like, I think in both cases, we're in, uh, I think it would be really tough to justify. Under, uh, so under U.S. Mm-hmm. law, an, atta- an offensive assault on another country um, without any you know, UN authorization, without any congressional authorization, that really just does not happen in the, in this way. So, um, and I think there's really no precedent for that in, in this at this scale. I mean, Iraq Congress authorized it. The UN, we said, authorized it. Um, you know, um, Kosovo is the only example of this where we really tried to go after a country without any congressional or uh, UN authorization. So that's the one example we have out there. Um, I, I I defer to Mark whether I, I but I agree with them. I don't think it would actually help. <laughs> but uh, but but I think legally it would be. Um, you know, again, there's some. You could, in theory, think about if you really pushed your mind to say, okay, we can do this um, for 90 days or something under the War Powers Resolution. But I think it it's, it's, it'd be a tough argument. There's not a lot of precedent for it. Kosovo is our best precedent for such a situation. Yeah. Is, um, you know, and that didn't even work either, exactly, to be honest, just on a practical level. Yeah. So one of our attendees uh, asked uh, how the Taiwan, U.S.-Taiwan Relations Act figures into our decision making. So this is a statute passed in the aftermath of our decision to sort of adopt a one China policy and Congress got together. And um, I think may have even, I don't know if there was a presidential veto threatened or actually in, enforced, um, but enacted the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, what, what What is the Taiwan Relations Act, Julian, and, and what relevance, if any, does it have here? Yeah, that's a good question. So it was enacted um, not over the veto, but with a lot of concern by President Carter's administration. Um, when when we recognized China, uh, the PRC as the government of China, and broke off relations with Taiwan, this is sort of a way just to keep Taiwan afloat. Without and, and, and we would it requires the U.S. to uh, maintain unofficial relations, um, and also most mm-hmm. importantly for this conversation is provide Taiwan with the with weapons so that it could defend itself, and then also mm-hmm. to maintain the capability to help defend Taiwan. But does not obligate the U.S. to defend Taiwan in any way, and nor does it authorize uh, the U.S. to defend Taiwan um, in that scenario. It just sets the policy that the U.S. policy is: we seek a peaceful resolution of this dispute, and we oppose any use of force or coercion. But it doesn't necessarily require uh, the U.S. to do anything in in a yeah uh, scenario. Yeah, got it. Um, okay, uh, Mark, any thoughts on any thoughts on that on that issue? Uh, no, I'm going to leave that one to the lawyers. All right, we'll leave it to the lawyers. There you go. All right. Well, I'll just say, um, it also, so, this is not a, we have no treaty with Taiwan. That's uh, someone in the question asked. This is all we have. Yeah. We have no treaty obligation. This is not Japan. This is not the Philippines. This is not Korea. Yeah. We have no treaty obligation. With Taiwan. There was there was a historical treaty with Taiwan, right? But that was abrogated by the right. We we literally formally said we're no longer going to follow this anymore uh, in 1979. So. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so Jared Vance asks, um, what the secondary effects of the U.S. sidestepping international law to defend an unrecognized state would be? Would it cause nations to cut ties with us? Would we have any sort of, you know, legal liability? I mean, not that there's an enforcement mechanism, but like, are we violating international law if we in fact go defend Taiwan? And it, 
it's you know not a recognized it's, it's not a recognized state. Could we and by the way, could we solve that problem? Somebody else asked the question. Could we solve that problem by simply affording them and some of our allies affording them diplomatic recognition? Would that be enough? Would they actually have to be a member of the UN? Um, is it sufficient that somebody recognizes them as their own state? Uh, so Julian, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, no, it's a good point. My 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 main, I'm not a huge like uh, we have to follow international law no matter what. I think it's just a practice. The second order consequence is real, which is that as we saw in Iraq. Um, and as we're seeing in Ukraine, it can make a huge difference in getting uh, international support for the U.S. actions if it's consistent with international law. And if it's not, it actually weakens the effectiveness of the U.S. response and its ability to get allies. Any response to Taiwan is going to really need support of Japan, ideally the Korea and the Philippines and Australia, and, and then Europe as well. And all those countries are really going to care a lot about the international law angle. Now, and that's why we need... And to- India. Yeah, and India. India too, um, right? <laughs> That's true. Um, although they're a little bit right, and they actually have a whole other view of this. But, but in any right. event, all those all those countries matter, and international law is an important way to sort of mobilize international support for Taiwan. That's what worries me because it's going to be much harder to do for Taiwan than for Ukraine, at least from a legal perspective. Now, one solution I, I think there is the recognition button, so to speak, where the U.S. and I think Japan recognize Taiwan as an independent country. There's right. even an argument that we should let the Chinese know that's what we would do <laughs> if they did invade Taiwan, like we would recognize it. Now, that doesn't make it a member of the United Nations, but it does arguably sort of give it a different status. And so at least for our purposes, mm-hmm. we are defending a state and it does have a customary right of self-defense. And so that would help, I think, legally. It might also provide a little bit of deterrence to China as well. So I think that would be a partial solution to the problem. And I think we'd have to make the argument that um, it has all the rights and obligations of the state, something like the argument we made for Kosovo, which it's under attack, it's facing this you know, potential genocide or humanitarian disaster, um, and therefore it should be independent to preserve their, you know, their human rights and security. We kind of made that argument for Kosovo. Not all countries in the world bought that argument, but a lot of countries did, including mm-hmm. the European countries. So I think that that's probably the scenario we're looking at here, which is a sort of a Kosovo. Uh, we need. Taiwan to be independent to protect its human rights and protect its civilian populations argument. Yeah. And Mark, do you have any thoughts on, on this question, whether from a military perspective, it makes more sense uh, for the USD to recognize Taiwan now uh, or before it goes into defensive, uh, a, a defensive uh, sort of war in favor of Taiwan? Uh, I'm going to leave the question about independence and recognition to the lawyers. But, but from a military yeah. point of view, what you do need to do is to get uh, as much equipment onto Taiwan as possible. Uh, mm. Stationing forces there is probably not in the cards, you know, because of the diplomatic sensitivities. There's been a lot of talk about me. Uh, I mean, Nancy Pelosi couldn't even go there. I mean, much well, they, less, they, much they, less, you know. There you go. Stationing forces there. there, there you right. go. Uh, uh, she did, but yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, but there's been talk about you know, you know prepositioning U.S. equipment on Taiwan. You know, technically it would be U.S., mm-hmm. but. Of course, in an emergency, you know, we might just give them the keys to the warehouses. Um, uh, so for military, you know, that is really important. Because what we found in the war game was that, uh, unlike with Ukraine, where we've been able to, you know, ship you know, vast quantities of weapons and munitions during the war, you can't do that with mm. Taiwan. The Chinese defensive bubble over Taiwan is just too powerful. Taiwan has to start the war with everything it's going to need for at least the first month and maybe for two months. Yeah, I'll just say yeah. one, two things, uh, Jamil. One is that there are, yeah, there are reports that there are 200 U.S. military advisors already in Taiwan right now. And that number is... Yeah, and another 100 more on the way. Right, another creeping up. Um, second, I think the most obvious way to make this clean from a legal perspective is recognize Taiwan, even if other countries don't, get as much support as you can, and then start putting U.S. troops there, right? As a sovereign country, mm-hmm. and now you can defend it. The problem with that approach... <laughs> Is that it, it might that act might, itself might trigger the war, and you don't want to be the one that triggers the war, right? The U.S. Is, doesn't the U.S. cannot be the one that started this fight. So, ironically, the best thing we could do for Taiwan, from militarily, might run up against, it might cause the war in the first place. That's the dilemma in the situation. Well, but this, but isn't this the whole problem, Julian? That we've been having this conversation for years, right? I mean, and, and the Biden administration in particular is so concerned, as they have been in Ukraine as well, right? Of of triggering the Russians to do more and, and provoking the conflict. But I mean, doesn't Ukraine just just demonstrate that you know 
you're not gonna you're not gonna move the needle on whether China goes in or not. What you, what's gonna happen is you're gonna actually provide a better defense if and when the time comes, right? I mean, is this really something to worry about? This parade of horribles, this sort of classic lawyer, you know, panic of of we can't do anything because it might cause all these downstream consequences. Yeah, I, that's fair. Although it on the other side, China's much more cautious than Russia, um, and it has a lot more to lose. Um, and I'll just point out that also they've been waiting 70 years and they haven't done anything. Right. So so I Fair. think you know, and so I think it's, you know, it's a tough call. I, I I'm leaning more these days toward we need to be a little more aggressive because Ukraine has taught us, like you said, that, look, you could do well. You know, it didn't help deter Russia just to be a little bit weak. On the other hand, from a political and international perspective, we cannot the U.S. cannot be the one that started the war. Taiwan cannot be the one that started the war. And we've built up 70 years of this sort of stasis. And if the U.S. is seen as the one that upsets the status quo, it's going to make it really hard, both within the U.S. and also outside the U.S., to mobilize any support for Taiwan. So it's so, yeah. so even if you thought that was the best action, it would still be uh, very yeah. difficult to pull off. I mean, of course, the Chinese are going to say that no matter what, like the Russians did. Oh, it was NATO's fault that we went into Ukraine, right? It wasn't, you know, um, or they started it, right? So, Mark, what about that? I mean, from your perspective, from a military perspective, should we be finding a way, whatever that way is, recognition or something else, a way to put more American forces on Taiwan now to get ahead of this problem? Uh, of course, the answer to that is a lot depends on whether you change your policy. And that is that we will defend mm. Taiwan, because if you put U.S. forces on Taiwan, I mean, you are now pretty much committed to its defense. So, you know, the idea of, well, we'll put, just put some forces there, and but we're not making any commitments. Uh, uh, you know, you're kidding yourself. You're going to be drawn in. Uh, uh, okay. you know, what, what the, on the legal side, as I said, you know, the, the key thing is being, you know, having those uh, the equipment on uh, Taiwan uh, ahead of time, and then uh, you know, perhaps even having um, uh, troops there ahead of time, or at least being able to reinforce before the war begins. Yeah. Now, you know, what's the legal framework you need for that? Again, I, I'll turn that over over to the uh, to the lawyers, yeah. but but. But mm -hmm. having having that equipment on uh, Taiwan is hugely helpful. You know, one of the things we found was that, you know, if Taiwan has access to large numbers of anti-ship missiles, for example, Harpoon being uh, one that the Navy uses, mm -hmm. uh, that's very helpful uh, because, you know, they can launch them from the island. They're very survivable because they can move around and they, they can really wreak havoc with the Chinese invasion forces. So, you know, uh, you know, ha having that sort of equipment on Taiwan, either whether we get given a tool, we've sold them a lot, or it's U.S., uh, ma that makes a big difference. Uh, you know, I'm just saying, legally, we have been yeah. sending them weapons of any kind, of every kind, uh, as long as they're defensive <laughs> over the last 60 years. So there will be no 50 years. There'll be no sort of real problem. I mean, the Chinese think it's all terrible and all illegal, but at least with respect to the status quo, we have been sending them weapons of this type. So it wouldn't break with that practice. Yeah. That sounds like that's probably the most important interim strategy is just to yeah. preposition as much stuff as we can. The Taiwanese are not the Afghans. They have a real army. They, uh, they have a real government. They're really motivated. We can turn over a lot of weapons to them um, and preposition a lot of stuff there. And I think, you know, that yeah. it would probably be, it could be used and in, in, in helpful in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, there's something. If, if I can jump in and make a, yeah, Mark. Here, though. Please. Uh, up until recently, really until January, uh, everything that the Taiwanese got, they bought. Uh, now, we have to allow them to buy it, but you know they would give us money and we would give them weapons uh, after. Right. In January, the uh, president got the authority for drawdown, the same thing he has for Ukraine. That is, he can now take U.S. equipment and send it to Taiwan. So, you know, a very different kind of uh, situation. Uh, and then the, there's a third situation, which is you know, we put stuff on Taiwan and it's technically ours, uh, right. but, you know, it's available to them. So, you know, there are, I, I think though we have different legal situations uh, on. Right, right. Yeah. And some of the purchasing, of course, is either financed by the U.S. or provided in grant form and then they buy it from us. So some, it varies in, in various pieces. You're exactly I, I, right. I, think, I don't think the Taiwanese get any grants. I mean, I think they just pay cold. So they're getting FMF. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, so um, so uh, our next question, and I think Julian, I think you sort of already answered this one, but I want I want to double tap this one. So Maurice Emmer asked, do we really think the the Chinese, the Communist Chinese Communist Party, is really worried about you know they're they're gazing at their own navel about like what are the legal limits to what I can do? I mean they're they're probably not concerned about international or or domestic law. Why should we be? 
<laughs> okay, uh, fair enough. Um, I think the there. Yeah, I think you're right. They are concerned about it, but um, uh, because again, for the same reasons we are um, not because they are the uh, you know international law has some abstract significance, but because they want to be able to mobilize international support for them, and even more than Russia, they need that because they're so embedded in the mm. economy. So they don't want country. So they need at least some plausible legal argument. Now they have one because there's their argument is very simple. It's ours. It's ours. Right. We can do whatever we want. It's ours. We can, matter, yeah. right? So we're done. Go here. pound sand. Right. right. And that's right. why uh it's so that's why right now they, they spend so much time saying it's part of China, part of China, part of China. Everyone agrees ahead of time is part of China, which means they can essentially do what they need to do if they need to. So so I, I don't think that so I don't they they do care about it, not because they they care about because they it helps them uh get allies or support i mean it, this argument is going to work i mean look countries like brazil aren't even convinced when there is an international argument like ukraine is being caught you know invaded brazil like yeah whatever right but um you know they're they're certainly not going to be moved by the taiwan scenario on uh in that situation where the china has already laid the groundwork where country like brazil has already agreed that taiwan's part of china right in their negotiations with china so, you know, Brazil's like, well, what am I supposed to do, right? It's part of China. Like, so, so that's why it does matter. And we need a way, what I've been calling for in some of my work recently is a strategy to start planning for that scenario. Not the military scenario, yeah. but the legal public relations battle that the U.S. is going to have to fight if it really wants to intervene. Yeah. So, um, so look, we've only got about four minutes, and I see you guys have been so popular that we have actually more questions now than when we started we still have 21 we've answered six questions we have 21 still remaining we're always going to get to all of them so i apologize to everybody in the audience for not getting to them. i'm going to take one or two more so i'll start with gary turner uh, gary asks um how did this idea julian that you laid out that u.s naval forces on water can't respond to an attack launched from mainland china other than defensive right how does that reconcile with the fact that we have u.s land forces stationed overseas germany south korea and the like and you know, they're almost certainly going to have to respond to the whole idea back in the 80s was they're there to respond to an attack launched from Russia and North Korea. What about that? Well, I think the scenario there is it's not so much the U.S. forces, it's the country they're in. And I think so they're in Germany. Mm. They're a treaty alliance with Germany. If Germany's attacked, mm. they have the right to work with Germany to defend itself by attacking the country that's attacking Germany. Again, this goes back to the Taiwan problem. And so that's why if these U.S. forces in Japan, I think it would be a lot easier to justify an attack on China itself in retaliation. The problem yeah. really is this, you know, this whole yeah. thing of, of, now I understand your international waters, you're being attacked. Uh, you can go after, and I, I think you can go after this particular sites that are attacking you. Like when Iran shoots pot shots at us, we can take shots at where they're shooting us from. We I, can't take out Tehran. I think we go further. I think we go further. I think there's some, this is, this is an issue we'd probably debate, right? I think John, you would disagree. I'm sure he would. I'm sure yeah. he would. Um, so, Mark, what what about your perspective on this from a military perspective? Like, how do we how do we think about is is there a difference between U.S. naval forces in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Straits and these U.S. land forces in Europe and 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 South Korea from a military perspective? Do you do you have that same sense that Julian does? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the naval forces are in international waters now. Of course, you know they have a right to be, uh, you know, not to be molested there. But that's different from a yeah. you know, U.S. forces on a the. The territory of a treaty ally, where yeah. we are bound to each other to defend each other, um, and you know, there's the you know, there's the whole collateral damage thing that you know might not have a legal basis, but you know, in public opinion, you know, it's you know, you know, firing missiles at something in the middle of the ocean is different from firing missiles at a base, you know, which has people all around it. Yeah. So um, the last question I'm going to take is for David Eggleston. David asks. Um, you know, doesn't a blockade have to be fairly successful to be legal? So would the PLA Navy have to have, have to have the capacity to actually impose a effective blockade in order for it to be actionable as a blockade? Julian, I'll start with you. Well, yeah, technically, there, there is a requirement. They actually have to be able, you can't just declare it and don't do anything. Uh, and then it's not really a blockade. And then no one's really obligated to, to abide by it. Um, but as I said, yeah. in this scenario, they're not going to call it a blockade under international law anyways. So and I'll leave to Mark whether they have the capability to do it. It sounds like they do, but um, but yeah. but the legality of it matters in the sense that if they're not actually enforcing the blockade, then countries don't really have any obligation to respect it. Seems obvious, yeah. but, uh, but but I think actually they, uh, I, I bet they do yeah. have. 
Uh, they have a so Mark, you have you get, yeah. So Mark, you have to have the last word. Does China have the capacity to institute the kind of blockade you laid out in scenario five? And isn't that the most likely scenario? And if so, from a military strategy, what would the, what what do you think the U.S. ought to do if China imposes a blockade of Taiwan, an actual effective blockade? Yeah, I mean the the answer to the first one is absolutely. I mean they have built uh, a large, powerful navy, and there's no and Taiwan is pretty small. So there's no question that they could, you know, they could impose a blockade that would meet the tests of effectiveness. Um, you know, during the Civil War, the U.S. did that, and was, you know, for the first couple of years, it wasn't really clear that, you know, this was effective enough. But, yeah. um, but the Chinese could do that. Um, yeah. You know, what would be the best, you know, uh, approach to the United States? I mean, this is a longer conversation, but the short answer, I mean, uh, as we were hearing, the U.S. does not want to be the one who shoots, fires the first shot. Uh, we want to make yeah. them fire the first shot. Now, you know, uh, reflagging tankers, escorting ships, doing stuff like that, you know, might be might put them in the position where they have to take the first first uh, shot. Uh, um, yeah. But but you know, I I think who shoots first is hugely important. Again, yeah. because of you know the sort of getting the rest of the world on your side. I mean, to the extent you want to have sanctions, for example, which would be very hard with China, but it's going to be impossible yeah. if people think that you are the aggressor. Yeah. Well, that's a wrap, guys. Thanks uh, to Colonel Mark Cancio, of CSIS, Dr. Uh, Professor Julian Koo. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the Federal Society uh, International Law and National Security Press Group. Please check out the Federal Society at fedsoc.org. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.